Born on a farm in Texas in 1890, Catherine Ann Porter lived to see great changes in American culture and technology by the time she died in 1980. The winner of numerous awards, including the Pulitzer Prize, Porter did not have a large literary output, but much of what she did write became literary classics. Her 1939 collection of three novellas, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, was, at least until recently, perhaps her best known work. She once said that the title story was inspired by her near-death experience during the 1918 influenza epidemic. Another story, Ship of Fools, was made into a successful film in 1965. The story he is set on a farm not totally unlike the farms Porter grew up on in Texas. After her mother died, Porter was taken in by a grandmother whom she adored. But when she was 10, her grandmother died and she was taken in by various family members in Texas and Louisiana. Porter dropped out of high school when she was 16 to marry a rancher, but divorced him after three years and headed to Chicago where she became a journalist. Even though she later spoke at colleges and received many honorary degrees, Porter was always keenly aware of her lack of a college education. Porter moved to New York and was able to support herself as a publicist and writer of children's stories for a while. In terms of short fiction, Porter finally gained recognition with the publication of her short story collection, Flowering Judas, which was published in 1935. The story He was one of 12 stories in that collection. He is about the Whipple family whose poverty is placed front and center during the opening lines of the story. Life was hard for the Whipples. It was hard to feed all the hungry mouths. It was hard to keep the children in flannels during the winter, short as it was. God knows what would become of us if we lived north, they would say. Keeping them decently clean was hard. Note that in this section I'm including photographs by Walker Evans who documented the lives of both rural and urban poor during the Great Depression. While the Whipples may not have been quite so badly off, Porter's story certainly captures the difficulties of the time period, particularly in the lives of farmers. The Whipple's younger son, who suffers from some sort of cognitive disability, is never mentioned by name. The parents refer to the boy as him and he, hence the title of the story. Although the narrator states that Mrs. Whipple loved her second son, the simple-minded one, better than she loved the other two children put together. The next line reads, She was forever saying so, and when she talked with certain of her neighbors, she would even throw in her husband and her mother for good measure. This leads the reader to wonder whether Mrs. Whipple's insistence on her love for her son is meant to convince not only her neighbors, but also herself. Just before the story's final paragraphs, the reader is taken inside of her, Mrs. Whipple's mind, where she is imagining life without him around. And we recognize the truth of her conflicted feelings about her son, even as she, Mrs. Whipple, never seems to grasp these feelings. Writer Reynolds Price once said of Catherine Ann Porter, the quality of the stories she told is fearless, steely, and lethal. Porter's stories take an aim as accurate and deadly as Nathaniel Hawthorne's, and her prose is leaner for dissecting deeper. The results are dazzling. Finally, I will end with a wonderful clip from an interview Catherine Ann Porter gave a few years before she died. In this clip, she speaks about writers who influenced her own writing. It's incredible that we have this video of an American writer who lived not only through the influenza epidemic and two world wars, but also lived to see the technological advancements of the late 20th century. I do when you were a child, you said that. You oh, also yes. said elsewhere that the, your first 25 years of reading would have made an autobiography in itself. It Who among the writers has been the greatest influence upon your own writing? I think I can guess. Is it Henry James? Well, Henry James is, has been my very 
I don't know, the great, wonderful example of what a, a really noble and really first-ranked artist is, who never, never flinched, never wavered, never gave an inch, you know, and he had enough to discourage him. I loved, the, he, I loved his courage, and his courage wasn't anything he thought of, go to, I must be brave, you know. He just was brave. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and besides that, he's a great artist. He's one of the best, he knows more about English now than anybody. I loved uh, Henry James, Hardy. Well, let's go back a little bit. Uh, uh, I was marvelously influenced by such things as, as uh, uh, well, for example, Maul Flanders. Mm. And then uh, uh, two or three of the 18th century English novelists. And, but coming up to such things as Wuthering Heights yes. was a novel. That, but from there to, to uh, Thomas Hardy was just a step, mm. you know. And I, I, was, I was thinking about the, the, but you know, it was not so much novelists. It was more poets. When I was 12 years old, I, oh, there I go. Mm. I love all this. <laughs> uh, when I was 12 years old, I learned all of Shakespeare's sonnets. Mm. I, could, I could recite them to you by heart if you didn't stop me. And yes. the words did stop me, I must say. <laughs> you can't <laughs> Miss Porter, we have about one minute. And I'm going to oh, ask dear, you a question yes. to fill one minute. Because uh -huh. I want to know what you would tell someone who wanted to become a writer in view of what you've just told me about the shocks and the experiences of your life, what would you say to a young writer? What's most important? I would say if you could possibly avoid it, do. Really? Why? <laughs> well, because it's such a painful life. It's so hard. And you sit so long with it. And don't let me complain, because it's not that. Yes. I'd just say, unless you're willing to face what it brings, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. That's all. It's something that you, it's a fate. And if you take it on, you've got to see it through. And that's what they don't want. They don't even, they're not able even to imagine. Do you remember what, when Yeats said, facing that wall, my solitary, sedentary trade. Well, that solitary, sedentary trade is full of, you know, I cannot, I, this is no complaint, mm -hmm. never. But it is, there is so much suffering in it. Yes. And you, that, that you cannot honorably well, escape. Ms. I Porter, sidestep every pain I can, we but to some you can't. We are I'm the sure. beneficiaries for the fact that you were willing to suffer that pain, and we thank you very much. Thank you.